everyone and welcome to the second in our series of videos on uh, business forecasting delivered to you by the Centre for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. So our first video was about basic questions about why we forecast and when we forecast and who forecasts. But we're now moving on to perhaps the question that most people ask, which is how to forecast. We won't be talking about that in great detail, but I will be giving, I hope, some pointers to some of the different approaches that are available. So let's start with recognizing that forecasting is a daunting and difficult task. And there's a famous quote, which you may have come across before, which is the prediction is always difficult, especially about the future. Obviously, this is a sort of semi-humorous comment, but it's also got some, um, uh, some serious intent as well, as we'll see. It comes from Niels Bohr, a famous physicist who was involved in some of the early work on the um, division of the atom. So a couple more quotes for you before we get into this in a little bit more detail. All forecasting, to some degree, relies upon our experience of the past. And here's two perhaps contradictory quotes which I think summarize this very well. Now, the first one says, you can never plan the future by the past. But the second says, I know of no way of judging the future but by the past. And so this is a very nice contradiction that we see here. Um, these two quotes, by the way, come from the very first page of one of the earliest books on business forecasting, which was by R.G. Brown, who wrote a book called Statistical Forecasting for Inventory Control. Now, if you look at the first quote, you can see it's a little bit of an exaggeration. Is it true that we can never plan the future by the past? Um, I'm not so sure. If we turn that round and say, you can't always plan the future by the past, then that would certainly be true. The second point is, of course, also very relevant. And this is what we're going to have to rely on, our past experience in order to make sensible predictions about the future. So let's now think about some broad categories of forecasting approaches. So I've categorized them very simply into scientific, where that word is perhaps used rather loosely, and judgmental. The scientific approaches um, are often implemented in computer-based systems, though they don't have to be, but they usually are in practice, and can be divided into the classic statistical methods, which some of you may be familiar with. Here's some examples, exponential smoothing, ARIMA methods, and regression methods. If you're not familiar with those, actually that doesn't really matter for the remainder of this video, and in future videos perhaps we'll be able to explain those approaches in more depth. Also, I've classed under the scientific umbrella what are now known as machine learning methods. And these methods, various examples are given there, neural networks perhaps the most well known in forecasting, but also other techniques such as gradient boosting have come to the fore in recent years. These methods don't rely so much on linear patterns, but can also deal with non-linearities. And I'll expand on that point a little bit later in this lecture. Now, that's fine, but in practice, many forecasts are actually not scientific in any meaningful sense, but they are exercised judgmentally. That might be by a single person, hopefully an expert. It could be by a jury of experts, a group of people who meet together, either physically or perhaps remotely. It could be based on focus groups or maybe projections from sales forces, where it's judgment that is coming to the fore here rather than any quantitative uh, methods or algorithms. So that's my basic distinction that I want to talk about. Statistic, um, scientific methods, I should say, and judgmental methods, and when each might be appropriate. So let's take uh, an example where scientific methods would definitely be appropriate. This is a very famous data series. It appeared in a well-known textbook by Box and Jenkins back in the 1970s. And it shows airline passenger data going right back from the late 1940s up until the early 1960s. And there's two things you can immediately see when we look at this. There's a clear upward trend. I think that's 
obvious from the graph. And also there's a clear seasonal pattern as well. And that pattern actually becomes more pronounced as time goes on. So we can model that mathematically. Now, in general, not just specifically to this example, there's other things which lend themselves to uh, scientific approaches. One is having a good length of data history. Because if we have a good length of data history, that enables us to pick out the patterns that are important in that particular series. And secondly, it's helpful if we have a shorter forecasting horizon. If we project a trend into the next month, let's say that could be reasonable, but to project that trend 10 years hence might be unreasonable. So these are the basic conditions that favor scientific methods, whether they be statistical or machine learning methods. What happens then if we have shorter data histories? Because in the previous example, we had over 10 years history, but often we don't. There's a number of things we can think about here. If the data is non-seasonal, this is actually not such a problem. Um, shorter histories are more manageable here. Even if we don't have a full seasonal cycle, it doesn't matter if the data is not actually seasonal. So if we can imagine we have a group of products and we've got, let's say, less than a full year data, but we know for some of them that they are seasonal, others are non-seasonal, then for the non-seasonal, actually having a short history is not such a problem even if it's just part of a seasonal cycle, as in that example. But for seasonal data, then the issue is a little bit more difficult. Because if we're just using that data series, then we need at least two cycles, actually preferably three, to try to tease out what's going on. If you think about having a single cycle, and you see at the end of the cycle, the data is showing a higher value than at the lower end, than at the uh, beginning of the cycle, is that because of a trend or is it because of a seasonal effect? You simply don't know if you only have one cycle of data. Unless there are some things we could do if instead of relying on a single series, we're able to rely on multiple series where we can assume there's some homogeneity. In other words, for example, that seasonal patterns are similar. So we might think about a group of products which have very similar characteristics and where it's reasonable to assume that their seasonal patterns are also very similar. Now, I've talked so far assuming that what we're trying to do is to take the history of data and project into the future, looking at such things as trends and seasonality and also autocorrelation. Autocorrelation is the tendency for a high observation to be followed by another high, that would be positive autocorrelation, or by the tendency of a high observation to be followed by a low, which would be negative autocorrelation. So in univariate forecasting, we just rely on the history itself and try to use methods that will tease out these factors. But sometimes we can go beyond that. Sometimes we can use explanatory variables. A classic example in retail is promotions. We all know that we would expect to see higher sales when a product is on promotion than when it's not. A promotion often is associated with some form of discount or buy one, get one free or some sort of offer of that nature. So in those cases, we can perhaps actually use that variable. And the variable, by the way, can be simply expressed, as I'll show in the slide to come, using a dummy variable. And this is, of course, especially useful if we know these things in advance. So we know things in advance where we can control them, such as promotions. We also, of course, know some special days in advance, like bank holidays, for example. But if we take other things, we need to be a little bit more careful. So we might, for example, want to use the weather as an explanatory variable, maybe temperature. Now we can do this, but we need to think carefully. Even if what we are looking at correlates strongly with weather, the question is, can we forecast the weather over the horizon? And if it's a short horizon, we probably can. If it's a long horizon, let's say six months hence, we probably can't. You can't really say much more than the usual seasonal pattern in that case. So let's take this example of promotions then. Here's a little graph which I hope will explain uh, what's going on. So we have in red the uh, sales, the actual sales, and you'll notice that they spike up and then go back to a base level and spike up again. And you'll also, if you look underneath, you'll see there's some lines there and those lines indicate when that item was on promotion. And there was a first promotion and then a second promotion. Well, this is a really good example of something we can model mathematically. We can say our sales, 
equals our base sales, in other words, what we would sell when we're not promoting, plus this dummy variable multiplied by uplift. And uplift means the increased sales that we're expecting as a result of promotion. Of course, that's not going to be precise as in all models, and so there is an error term as well. The promotional dummy variable is very simple. It's a one when we're on promotion, and it's a zero when we're not on promotion. So going back to the equation, when it's zero, we ignore it, and the sales just equals the base sales with an error term. But when it is on promotion, then the sales is the base sales plus the uplift plus the error term. So this is really helpful if we can establish this pattern. And of course, if we've had previous promotions, particularly if we've had previous similar promotions, then we should be able to model this and actually estimate what those base sales and uplift factors are, which can be done using regression modeling. Now, what about machine learning methods? This has been a hotly debated topic within the forecasting community over recent years. And some competitions have shown similar accuracy between statistical methods and machine learning methods. A recent competition has shown some advantage for machine learning methods. So we know that they can be more accurate than statistical methods. But there's a few factors we need to take into account. The first is they're not always more accurate. We shouldn't assume they will be more accurate. What we should actually do is test them and actually compare the best statistical model against the best machine learning model, for example. Also, we need to bear in mind that some of the methods which have done well in competitions are very computationally expensive. They take a very long time to run. And therefore, you have to ask yourself, is that realistic in the situation that we face? If you need to generate forecasts every day and you need to do so within a one hour window, you need to make sure that your algorithms will run and complete within that one hour. Otherwise, it's not practical. And a further point is that machine learning methods have sometimes been criticized as being a little bit of a black box, less interpretable in other words. So going back to the previous example, we can actually interpret that uplift factor, which we estimated, as being the effect of the promotion. So that's quite nice. And that can help us to decide whether it's worthwhile investing in that promotion or not. With, statistic, with machine learning methods, it's rather more difficult to interpret uh, the, the outcomes. Pulling back a little bit and forgetting for a moment about the distinction between statistical and machine learning methods, all scientific methods make a basic assumption. And that is that the future over the horizon that we're interested in resembles in some way the past over our data history. That doesn't mean to say that the data in the future is going to be the same as the data in the past. If we take that earlier example, we can see that won't be the case because of the strong trend. But we are assuming that that trend that we've seen recently will continue into the future and that the seasonal pattern we've seen will continue into the future. Very often this is a reasonable assumption, but not always. So here's three examples. Suppose we've got no data history. Well, what is, what is it resembling? There isn't a past for it to resemble. Unless, of course, we may have some analogous products or analogous services, perhaps we can use them instead. Another issue is the point about the long forecast horizon that I mentioned a little earlier. Projection of a trend over a short period is reasonable, but over a long period becomes much less so. Or, of course, we can have what's sometimes called a structural break in the series. And the best example of that in recent times has been the pandemic, when we may have had a fairly stable series prior to the pandemic, let's say, of sales. And then suddenly the pandemic hits and we see sales drop quite dramatically in some cases, and then it takes time for them to recover. So here we again need to be careful that just because we've seen a level recently in the past does not mean to say it'll continue into the future. And similarly, if a trend has been seen recently in the past, that may not prevail in the future either. So this opens up the question of where we can use judgment. And the first example I want to give is when we're looking at long horizons. I think anybody can realize that forecasting with accuracy over a long forecast horizon, 10 years or 20 years, is an exceptionally difficult thing to do. But it can still be useful if we are considering making major investments, let's say in new plant or new locations, things like this, which are going to require that horizon 
to be considered. And so what we can do instead of looking for the most likely outcome is to think about scenarios. And there's a definition here on the screen. So a scenario is a consistent set of statements about possible future trends and their dependencies. So it's not a forecast about the most likely future. It is actually a set of statements about a possible future. Now, of course, you may think, well, yes, I can easily think about a possible future, but it's only one. So in practice, what we would want to do is think about a set of scenarios. So a whole list of different possible outcomes that could, be, uh, that could prevail in the future. If we can do that, and we would normally have that not just expressed numerically, but also with some text, perhaps, to describe these scenarios and to describe the dependencies, that can help us to think through our strategies and think about strategies that might be robust. In other words, that might work well with a number of different possible scenarios which may come to pass in the future. Let's move from the long horizon to shorter horizons now. We know in practice, and there's been a number of studies here and they're listed uh, on the slide, which show that we know that judgment is used extensively in short-term forecasting. There could be good reasons for that. It could be a new product, as I've just indicated. And you see the very first line talks about pure judgment. But then there's other possibilities. We could have a pure statistical forecast, or maybe an average of the two, or possibly uh, having a statistical forecast then amended judgmentally. So all of these things are possible. The big question, of course, is, is it a good thing? Is it a good thing for people to exercise judgment to change a statistical forecast? There's been a number of studies uh, on this subject, and some of those studies show that it can be beneficial for forecast accuracy. But judgment can be overused. In other words, not used when it shouldn't be used. It's being used too much. It's been used in cases where actually the scientific method would be quite satisfactory. And so in these cases, we can actually find that judgment can be harmful to forecast accuracy. And why is that? Here's some reasons. There's lots more. One obvious reason is political bias. So this is where the person making the forecast doesn't even want it to be perfectly accurate. They want it to be very high or they want it to be very low. They might want it to be very high to impress their more senior colleagues in their organization. They might want it to be very low because they think that will influence a target and that will means they can meet that target. There are various reasons. But it's not just intended biases. There's also unintended biases as well. We know that there can be a tendency for people to over forecast, to forecast too high, particularly when we're looking at a favorable outcome like sales. Or if we're thinking about the time taken to complete a project, they're optimistic in a different way. They tend to um, forecast that the project will take shorter time than it actually does. And also overconfidence. So in other words, people think that their forecasts are going to be more accurate than they actually turn out to be in practice. And another very practical point is this. If we have demand planners or other people responsible for changing forecasts, when we want them to use that time wisely and to execute the, the adjustments when they're really needed, what is not a good use of their time is fiddling with forecasts and changing them very slightly, because quite frankly, that will make no difference to forecast accuracy and is not a good use of their time. So how can we see whether judgment is working or not. A very simple approach is called forecast value added, perhaps more accurately termed forecast accuracy added, but the, the, um, the actual concept is a very sound one. So here we've got three examples. We've got a system forecast, which could be generated by a statistical method or a machine learning method, it doesn't matter. And then we've got this measure of its accuracy, or better, its inaccuracy, the mean absolute percentage error is 30%. And um, we'll perhaps deal with this subject in another video, but all the mean absolute percentage error is doing is taking the, each of the errors. So for example, if the actual is 100 and we forecast 90, we're out by 10, so that's 10% error. And we don't worry whether it's up or down, and we simply average those. That's what the mean absolute percentage error is. So we want it to be low. The lower the mean absolute percentage error, or the MAPE, the better. 
If we look at the figures, 30% is the original uh, mean absolute percentage error. But with the analysts revising the forecast, the average dropped to 20%. So that's great. That's a 10% um, bonus, so to speak. But then if we look at the third row, the executive who then finally amends and makes the final forecast has actually made matters somewhat worse. Because although the executive is better than the system forecast, the executive is worse than the analyst revised forecast. And so instead of adding value, they've actually subtracted value from that process. And so that has not been helpful. So clearly this is a process that will need to be reconsidered. So to summarize then, I'll repeat what I said earlier because I think it's very important that scientific methods are most useful when the future, particularly over the forecast horizon, resembles the past over the data history. Now, it's very difficult for humans to do better than scientific methods, such as statistical or machine learning methods, do better than them a pattern recognition. That's what these methods are good at. However, the judgment that I've been talking about comes into its own when that condition is not met. So in other words, we've got short histories, long horizons, or sudden changes. But judgment is subject to its own biases, which we've just reviewed. But in the end, in any comparison, we can always look at the accuracy of one approach against another in a sometimes called a test set or a holdout sample, and we can actually see what the difference is. And we can use a forecast value added analysis to ascertain which approach will be more appropriate. Now that concludes what I've wanted to say about this. We'll have future videos which will talk about these methods in much more depth, and I hope um, you'll join us for those. And if you want to learn more about the Center for Market Analytics and Forecasting, you can see the details on the screen at the moment. We have a YouTube channel, which has not just these educational videos, but also our Friday forecasting talks as well. And you can follow us on uh, Twitter or follow us via the website, or indeed, you'd be very welcome to contact us directly. Thank you.